Over on SFO Arcade, we just finished up Forspoken, the latest PS5 exclusive, so I guess it's finally time to talk about it. And yes, it stinks. I wouldn't break out the indefensible intro and title if it didn't. Let me give you the history. Square Enix's early history is one of console exclusivity. Square games came out only on the NES and then the SNES. Then they famously jumped ship to Sony, choosing the PlayStation 1 over the Nintendo 64 due to the latter opting to stick with cartridges that maxed out at 32 megs, while the former utilized CDs with a storage capacity of 700 megs. Back in the 90s, Square made the claim that Final Fantasy VII just wouldn't fit on a cartridge. And as a kid of the 90s, let me tell you, this fueled a lot of schoolyard fights. Square continued to be exclusive to Sony during the PlayStation 2, for the most part. The strategy of Square Enix exclusivity worked because each of these console generations had a clear winner. The console that Square had backed was wildly more popular than the other options. But with the 7th generation of consoles, that's the Wii, Xbox 360, and PS3 by the way, all three of them were exceptionally popular, and Square Enix realized that remaining loyal to Sony meant losing money. So they developed a proprietary engine called Crystal Tools, meant to streamline the production of their big upcoming title Final Fantasy XIII, making it easy to run on multiple platforms. The only problem is it sucked. Crystal Tools ended up being a huge Square Enix boondoggle, delaying the release of Final Fantasy XIII by almost two years while offering little to no value. By 2011, the Crystal Tools engine had already been pushed to its breaking point during the development of Final Fantasy XIII 2. Cracks were showing, and Square Enix needed something else if it was going to be able to keep up on the PS4 and Xbox One. You'd think, after the failure of Crystal Tools, Square would be smart enough to not do this again, and maybe they'd use more conventional, more functional, more well-documented developer tools, maybe license an engine like Unreal or Unity or something. But no, they made the exact same mistake. To solve their Crystal Tools problem, Square Enix developed the Luminous Engine in 2012, and showed it off at the E3 of that year with the tech demo Agni's Philosophy. Now if this looks familiar, that's because it should. A lot of it ended up becoming Forspoken 10 years later, which is also why huge chunks of Forspoken look about 10 years old. The Luminous Engine ended up having all the same problems that Crystal Tools did, becoming another giant money pit for the company. To date, only two games have used the Luminous Engine, Final Fantasy XV in 2016 and Forspoken in 2023, 11 years later. So, broken engine, decade-old art assets, last-ditch attempt to recoup monumental cost. Forspoken's off to a great start, isn't it? What else could go wrong? Well, it was officially announced three years ago as Project Athia. And when you go back and watch that old 2020 trailer, you can see a lot of the pieces that would come together to later be Forspoken. These locations, that dragon, it's all in the game. But this trailer was considered to be a huge joke. Look closely. She's not wearing boots or some kind of era-appropriate footwear. She's wearing kicks. Air Jordans, baby! That's when we all knew we were in for a fucking ride. I'm gonna spoil everything about Forspoken because I don't care. You shouldn't either, but if for some dumb reason you do, now's your chance to bail out. The plot of Forspoken is the most bog-standard isekai plot I've ever seen. Isekai is a Japanese word meaning different world, and it refers to a genre of storytelling where a character from world A inexplicably finds themselves in world B and has to contend with a sudden upheaval. It's basically a fantastical version of the fish out of water story. Even though the word isekai didn't really start to be used until the glut of 80s and 90s anime that used the trope. This type of story has existed for quite a while. The quintessential western isekai, for example, is Alice in Wonderland, and looking at Alice gives us a basic idea of what the rules are. 1. The world that the protagonist originates from is generally the modern, real world, at the time the story was written. In Alice, that's Victorian England, while in Vision of Escaflone, for example, that's 90s Japan. Rule 2. What differentiates isekai from a normal travel epic like Lord of the Rings or Journey to the West is that the protagonist in an isekai doesn't go on a daunting yet physically possible journey like crossing a continent. The journey is seemingly an impossible one, making the quest to get back home nigh insurmountable. In Alice, Wonderland is sometimes portrayed as an alternate dimension, and sometimes as Alice's own psyche. In Escaflone, Gaia is an invisible, habitable planet caught in Earth's orbit. In Digimon, the characters go into a physical representation of the internet. In The Black Knight, or A Kid in King Arthur's Court, or Chrono Trigger, the characters are flung through time with seemingly no way back. In a countless number of isekai anime, especially pornographic ones, as well as those old cartoon shows where your average kid gets sucked into the TV like Captain N, the alternate world operates like a video game. Rule 3. Some people are tempted to call a movie like Avatar an isekai, since the trip to Pandora is through deep space. Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's not an isekai because of the third rule. The protagonist has to be somewhat isolated, and must adapt to living in a totally alien culture. In Alice and Escaflone, the characters are alone. In Digimon, it's a small group of kids. To contrast, in Avatar, a ton of humans have moved to Pandora and set up shop, recreating Earth-like habitats. Of course, people have played around with the genre. Sometimes you'll see a reverse isekai, like Beastmaster 2 or Thor, where the protagonist is from a fantasy world and crosses the dimensions to come to our world. 
Sometimes the protagonist doesn't adopt the role of a prophesized hero in the other world, and instead becomes a villain, like in My Next Life as a Villainess, or as a side character, like in That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime. But pretty much all isekai stories hit the same beats. The protagonist's life in their original world is pretty shitty. By random chance, the protagonist encounters a piece of the other world. Maybe it's a person who crossed over, maybe it's an artifact, but whatever it is, it inexplicably pulls them across the barrier. Once on the other side, the protagonist is stuck with no way back. New friends help the protagonist through the initial period of despair, and they begin to right wrongs in their new home and grow as a person. At the climax of the story, they finally have the opportunity to go home, and they take it. But once they're back, they realize they've changed too much. They can't go back to how things used to be. Their old life sucks, their new life is full of meaningful relationships, and now all they want to do is go back to the other world again. Eventually they do, generally just in time for the final confrontation with whatever villain happens to be at the center of all the events happening in the other world. A confrontation that our side heroes wouldn't be able to overcome without the protagonist's return. It's also revealed at some point that the reason all of this happened in the first place is because the protagonist, despite having an outwardly mundane life, has had some connection to the other world this whole time, generally because one of their parents has traveled across the barrier in their youth and secretly settled in our world. Isekai stories are so old hat that any modern attempt either plays with the formula to make something new or sarcastically leans into the genre, parodying the whole thing and breaking the fourth wall constantly. Forspoken does neither of those things. In fact, Forspoken is the most by-the-books isekai story I've ever seen. It feels like an AI generated the script. It follows every single convention of the genre. Frey lives a shit life as a poor black woman on the run from both the law and gangs in New York City. She breaks into a building to steal what looks to be a very expensive gold brace. The brace sucks her into the fantasy world of Athia, from Project Athia, remember, where she is a mage specializing in earth magic. The land is covered in a consuming blight that corrupts all life and turns them into zombies, and the townsfolk desperately need a hero. The first three quarters of the game consists of very generic open world wandering and fetch questing with little in the way of actual plot, until Frey wakes up one day and finds herself back in New York, this time living a much more comfortable life. This is the one real deviation from the Isekai convention, Frey's trip back to her old life ends up being an illusion created by another mage, she doesn't actually go back, but it serves the same emotional purpose. After this sequence, the final couple hours of the game is literally just cutscenes. They seriously dump all of the lore and the story on the player in the final stretch, expecting us to care when it's actually just really boring. And the lore that they dump is something that we all predicted within the first hour of the game. The Blight corrupted the other three mages, called Tantas, powerful wise women who wield fire, water, and wind magic to complement Frey's earth magic. Frey is the daughter of the original Earth Tanta, who in a fit of madness throws her baby into the portal to New York. No, seriously, she just yeets that fucking kid. And all of the tomfoolery is caused by her talking gold brace, yeah, it talks by the way, who turns out to be an ancient evil sealed by the Tantus. This guy, Cuff, is one of the more annoying parts of the game. He serves as the game's guide, like Navi in Ocarina of Time or Fee in Skyward Sword, but Cuff is more annoying than any of them. And unlike in the Zelda games, he's not bouncing off a silent protagonist, he's paired with Frey, who is just as fucking annoying. These two together, their dialogue written by millennials who don't know how to take anything seriously whatsoever and have to insert Marvel-style jokes and quips every second, make for the cringiest moments in the entire game. Did I just do that? Well, definitely with my assistance. I did not just do that. We did. I just moved shit with my mind. Perhaps our connection has somehow awoken some abilities. I just moved shit with my mind. I just keep hearing I, I, I. I just moved shit with my freaking mind! <laughs> Yeah, okay, that is something I do now. I do magic, talk to sentient cuffs, kill jacked up beasts. You know what? I'll probably fly next. Now you're just being ridiculous. Oh, that's too far. Good to know there's a line. If you could just master these new abilities, with my help, of course. Um, did you not just see me take out that gnarly beast? Oh, bring it, you mangled monsters. But to the game's credit, it's very rare that the tutorial helper becomes the main villain. Using the Zelda examples again, Navi is just a random fairy, Fee is your sword come to life, Midna is an important character in her own right but not the villain, and Hell in Spirit Tracks, the helper is the spirit of Princess Zelda, serving as both romantic interest and a ghost. But a villain? I can't say I've seen that before, I don't think. Anyway, that's the whole story. The entire thing is predictable the minute you realize you're playing an isekai. It brings nothing new to the table, and nearly everything old that it did, it did very poorly. But hey, there's more to a game than the story, right? What about the rest of it? Well, the game itself looks pretty hideous. The open world can be pretty sometimes, at least from a breathtaking vista perspective, but the actual world itself seems barren, and I don't mean because the blight has depopulated the land. It seems unfinished, and sometimes it literally just is unfinished. The enemies that you fight, from zombies to animals to humans, are all generic but work well enough. The characters you meet though, good god. 
You can tell development on this game started in 2012, because it certainly looks like it. Sometimes Forspoken looks like it's a PS3 title, not a PS5 one, and the cutscenes also just look unfinished. Check this clip out of Frey breaking down a door with her magic. Not a single muscle twitches on her face as she blasts the door away, which by the way, we don't even get to see because the camera cuts away last minute. Gotta save development time somehow. Just don't animate that break-in scene, guys. No one will notice. It'll be okay. As for what's actually in the open world itself, there's not much. You can find collectibles, like the same five herbs for potions arranged in the exact same pattern, like they just copy pasted the cluster of them, or the same groups of zombies and wolves. Sometimes you'll find a dungeon, which is a short set of duplicated hallways with a boss at the end. And these can be kind of fun, if only because you're about to get some pretty good loot. Sometimes you'll find a spring where new spells can be unlocked, but these are few and far between. For the most part, there's just nothing to do in the open world. Despite the low quality of the visuals, this is a demanding game on PC. The recommended Steam specs are ridiculously high for what you're getting. Also, the game is 150 gigs, dude, what the absolute fuck? The world's big, but it's not bigger than Skyrim, or Hyrule in Breath of the Wild, or the Commonwealth in Fallout 4. The only good part about the graphics are the spell effects, which do legitimately look magical. The flaming spear, the orb of water, the glitter that splashes off Frey's shoes when she runs around with magic speed. It all fits really well. And considering that the Luminous Engine was made specifically for those types of effects, it's no surprise that that's what stands out. The magic is, in fact, one of the only true positives of the game. The equipment system allows you to put on different cloaks and necklaces, the only two equip slots, and you can upgrade them with random bits and bobs you find in the open world, which is the same as most RPGs. You can do your nails by putting different runes on them as well, but all of these systems serve to buff your magic. The magic is what takes center stage, and it's pretty fun. It's satisfying to use the wide array of spells at your disposal. It's cool when you take out one of the Tantas and learn their elemental magic, and each of the four elements has their own skill tree that you plug experience points into in order to unlock new spells and buff existing ones. And man, there are so many legitimately fun spells. You can throw rocks in a rapid succession or charge up for one big blast. You can swing a flame sword around or toss flame spears that explode on impact. You can encase enemies in a giant ball of water or fire a horizontal spread of ice shards. You can throw electric darts or charge up a huge lightning storm and more. There's dozens of spells, all with their own unique effects and feel. And the trailer to the game has no problem emphasizing the variety. The issue is you only unlock the other schools of magic by defeating the Tantas. And defeating the Tantas is the whole point of the game. You spend a huge chunk of the early game with earth magic, unlock fire magic halfway through, and you really only get a smidge of time with water and wind. In fact, once you kill the final Tanta and unlock the wind magic, that's when the final two hours of exposition dump begins. There's no enemies, no challenges, no opportunities to use any of your cool new wind magic. There's long, boring cutscenes telling you stuff you figured out hours ago if you're smart, punctuated by empty rooms that contain nothing but experience pickups you have to run around and collect, and an NPC who triggers the next cutscene. I'm not fucking kidding, dude. It feels like they knew they just gave you a new skill tree in the final hour of the game and said, oh shit, this is useless, unless we just dump a bunch of EXP on you so you can level it up. In a well-designed game, you unlock your core abilities relatively early on so that the game has the opportunity to develop their use. In Zelda Breath of the Wild, you get bombs, magnets, time stop, and ice freeze all in the opening area of the game because the entire game is all about using these tools to solve puzzles. Even in more linear Zeldas, the most useful tools show up in the early to mid game. This is elementary stuff in game design. You can even go back to Secret of Mana on the Super Nintendo, where you unlock every single magic school with the exception of, I think, nature magic in the first half of the game. Or Lufia 2, where the bombs, arrow, and hookshot are all obtained in dungeons pretty early on. Any competent game knows to give you the bulk of your kit by the halfway point so that you can actually get good at using it and save only the advanced stuff for later on, like Knights of the Round in Final Fantasy VII, or the alien weapons in Fallout. But in Forspoken, you're filling out a completely new skill tree that you'll never actually use in the final hour. The other interesting part of the game is movement. Each school of magic comes with a different movement ability. You start with magic running and magic parkour, which is the reason that Frey keeps her Air Jordans from the other world. In New York, she was a parkour artist. A parkourist? Whatever. Once you gain fire magic, you unlock a grappling hook that feels a lot like the ODM gear from Attack on Titan. And chaining parkour flips with grapples is legitimately really fun. With water magic, you unlock surfing, which I had to find a clip of online because there's never a reason to ever enter a body of water in this game where surfing would be required. And with wind magic, you unlock a quadruple jump, which isn't really that interesting because you have to stay in place and charge it in order to do it, breaking the whole flow feeling of getting around the game. There is a glider in the game, the float spell, which in my opinion is an open world must have ever since Breath of the Wild did it in 2016. But you can only unlock it near the end of the game. And for some reason, it's a water spell, not a wind spell. In other games that have included gliders, like Zelda or Horizon Forbidden West, you pick them up early on because game developers realized just how much they aided exploration in an open world environment. Letting you drift to a location you can see on the horizon from a tall area is actually really cool. Putting the float spell at the very end of the game, long after you'd ever need it, just doesn't make any sense. 
You can tell that I'm an old man at this point, considering how many old games and shows I'm referencing that did parts of what Forspoken tried to do, but better. Here, I'll put a bow tie on the whole thing. Forspoken reminds me of Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. For you Zoomers who don't know what that is, here's the TLDR. In the early 90s, Japanese game developers thought that Americans were too dumb to understand RPGs. RPGs were the most popular genre in Japan, but platformers ruled the day in America, and Square was worried about spending tons of time translating Final Fantasy games only for them to have a poor reception. So they had an American development team create what is now derisively known as Baby's First RPG. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest has all the mechanics and feeling of a mainline Final Fantasy game on the Super Nintendo, but with everything drastically dumbed down to make it more accessible. Now it's still a pretty good game, great music specifically, but oh boy is it easy. Mystic Quest features easy to dodge enemies instead of random encounters. New armor overwrites old armor instead of actually being equipable. There's only four weapons in the whole game that you upgrade a couple times. Items and spells are identical, like a potion and the cure spell do the exact same thing. The story is laughably simplistic, but at the end of the day, Babby Dev had a good time with it. Playing Forspoken feels like playing Mystic Quest. Yeah, you can go into dungeons, but they're basically the same thing with similar loot every time. Yeah, you can equip necklaces and cloaks, but they don't really offer much in the way of upgrades beyond just flat bonuses to magic, or sometimes a specific element, and upgrading them is just a linear progression. There's no super amazing loot to find that radically changes the game somehow. Putting runes on your nails is the same thing. You slap on the 5% damage nails and then wait until you find the 10% damage nails. Rinse and repeat. The same herbs craft the same one potion you use all game, and you find them in every single zone. If Mystic Quest was Babby's first JRPG, Forspoken is Babby's first open world game. Everything in it is a dumbed down version of something from a better game. And if Forspoken was only Babby's first open world game, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. If the only issue with the game was simplicity, it would be a perfect game to hand to a kid, or a new gamer or something who wanted to get into it, as a gateway into something more complicated like Fallout or Skyrim. In this context, we can even forgive the paint by numbers storyline. If it's literally your first isekai because you're six years old, I'm sure it'll feel magical to you. Though then again, who lets their six-year-old play a game that drops the F-bomb every 30 seconds? But it's not only the simplicity. It's the genuinely awful pacing of the game in terms of both plot and mechanics. It's the emptiness of the world, the ugliness of it. It's how the game feels fun for a little bit until you realize you've just spent hours doing nothing because there's nothing in the game to do, and what little there is is mediocre at best. So it's no surprise that this game got absolutely bombarded by fans online. The Steam page for Forspoken looks like the aftermath of a gangbang, and even though there's reports of the developers deleting reviews, it doesn't actually matter that much because the reviews are overwhelmingly negative, too many for them to handle. The Metacritic score doesn't look all that great either, and the game's already seeing some price drops. Square Enix went through all this hassle over the Luminous Engine only to make two games with it. Final Fantasy XV might have been a success, but Forspoken, which came at the end of the engine's life, seems to be a total flop on multiple dimensions. We're this deep into the video, and I haven't even addressed the elephant in the room. Frey, the main character of Forspoken, is black. Dun dun dun. Now I personally don't care what race the characters in any game are, shouldn't be an issue. And there are a few idiots out there who are just straight up saying the main character in the game is black, no thanks. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? No, the problem with Frey isn't that she's black, it's that she's black. Capital B black, political black. And the minute that you notice that, suddenly a whole bunch of things come into focus. Like the way she speaks when engaging with the fantasy world of Athia, or how insistent she is on keeping her Air Jordans so that she can parkour around the wilderness, or how doing her nails up in garish patterns is a core mechanic, or how back in New York she lives in a crack shack but still displays proudly her expensive collection of kicks on a shelf in a central location. Forspoken clearly wants to be like a BLM game. It opens on Frey in court with a rap sheet filled with thefts. She gets a lenient sentence from the judge who takes pity on her, and then she immediately goes out into the streets and gets jumped by a gang that she owes money to or something. I don't know, and it doesn't matter, because you never actually see these characters again anyway. Frey manages to parkour away to safety, but the whole thing stinks of social commentary regarding the black inner city experience or something. I already don't buy this setup, because this girl is 21, beautiful, and living in 2023. She's got a phone. There's no way she wouldn't start selling OnlyFans at Make a Bank and get the fuck out of here. And this discrepancy is made more clear by the fact that they cast one of the hottest chicks around right now to play her. After admiring that shoe collection, she falls asleep back at the crack shack, only to wake up to the whole place on fire. It's pretty clear that the gang lit her apartment up as revenge, and this is when probably the dumbest sequence in the whole game happens. So Homer! Girl, come on, we gotta go! Gotta find Homer first. Gotta find Homer first. Gotta find Homer first. That's right, even though the duffel bag full of her life savings, in cash, is right at her feet, the money she's been scrimping together to be able to move the fuck out of New York for years, the game forces you to leave the money behind to go and find your pet cat. After which, of course, you lose the money. 
There's no reason for this. It's just right fucking there, dude. Just pick it up and go. Frey survives the fire, though, and in desperation, looks through the window of a building, sees Cuff, and decides to steal him to make some money, kicking off the adventure. And it's at this point that, beyond Frey's terrible personality, the political content of the game vanishes. They clearly tried to go for some sort of message, but it disappears from the game entirely. It doesn't even come back when she goes into the dreamscape, thinking she's back in her old life again. In fact, in that multi-hour cutscene where the entire plot is dumped at the end, it's revealed that while her mother is a Tanta from Athia, her father is a random black dude from New York named Al. I personally like to think it's Al Roker. But where is the guy? Frey's mother clearly knows him before she gets pregnant, and she didn't get magically transformed into a dragon until after she gave birth and yeeted Frey through the portal. Oh yeah, Frey's mother got transformed into a dragon, but it's not important. The point is, where is Frey's dad? He's not keeping up with the love of his life? The woman that he knocked up from the other fucking dimension? Nah, nobody hears from him again. He's literally the stereotype of the black absentee father. They're uh, really going all out with the representation, eh? However, even with the reveal of Frey's parentage, the political aspect of the game never returns. Frey settles into her new life as the protector of the blissfully deracialized world of Athia and abandons our world and its problems entirely. Here's the real kicker though. The game's awful, like I'd give it a 4 out of 10, but because it has this wallpaper of black politics, because if you only played the first hour of the game, you might think it's highly politically charged. There's a lot of retarded progressives online right now who think that if you hate the game, it has to be because you're a racist. Can't be any other reason. Can't be that the game is poorly designed or ugly or buggy or not all that fun to play. Nope, it's because you're a fucking white male, even if you're not. Is the game good? Yes, the game is good. Fuck social media. Get you the game is is what I'm about to be saying. That's gonna that's gonna be the title. Fuck social media, buy the game, okay? Cause people tripping. No, I promise you, if you're playing the game, you're not gonna sit here and be like, oh my god, the dialogue. Oh my god, it's so bad. I can't play the game. Cause every three seconds, I see someone on social talking about. They see one clip and it's like that's the whole game. Come on, bro. Damn, you just stepped on my throat. I just kicked a whole deer, bro. Y'all didn't even see that for real. If you haven't actually seen anything other than the one clip from a scene that wasn't even that cringy, I don't want to hear about the dialogue. Like I said, if she looked like any other, anything else, if she looked like anything else and she said the same scene, no one would bat an eye. It'd be like, what the hell? It would just be bad writing. Like, it's not the best writing, but it's not a bad game. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not a bad game. It's like the basic writing. It could be better. They probably could have got black writers, but they didn't. That's unfortunate. Check out the Robin Hood one. But the game's not as gear and how you heal up and the crafting isn't too much. Like, cause some I hate crafting in the games and the crafting's not overbearing. You get like you can change these nails that give you different powers. Like, I don't know. I just I'm fucking with the game. It's a good game. The story is not even horrible. The story is a story, but I ain't like, damn, this plot is ass. I'm following it, and I don't follow stories that well. I'm here. And of course, prog game developers are out here saying the exact same thing. Do I think that some of the energy and vitriol and just discussion about this game is happening because, some, because it is a lead female black character and it is on a playstation game versus an xbox game yes i do and then people push back well i haven't seen anything written like that really you can't read between the lines so do you ever actually see somebody when they're shitting on game pass go i don't really have an issue with game pass i just like playstation and want microsoft to lose or when someone's being a misogynist do they own being a misogynist and say well here's the real fucking deal the real fucking deal is uh, women scare me. I don't really like them. I don't trust them and they don't want to fuck me. That's why I'm really upset about this game. No one talks like that. It's called subtext. So of course you're not seeing people overtly saying I'm not playing Forspoken or I'm shitting on Forspoken or I'm giving an unjust given the success of what it looks like the game is going to have amount of time and energy on the internet and in my writing to first spoken because I'm a racist. They're not gonna say that. Oh, and Bakaki wants you to know if you don't stream for spoken tonight, you're a racist and a misogynist. Oh, of course, of course. If you read sarcasm from that clip, I promise you he was being serious. That's David Scott Jaff. 
Of course, the Polygon review of the game has to dive into this topic as well, and outwardly they appear to have the same take that I do. Before I wrap up, let's spare a word for Frey, a notionally black protagonist who joins a growing trend in media of putting black people in worlds where race is inconsequential. Except the game is very insistent that Frey is a New Yorker, mysterious birth or not, spending her entire life up until this point growing up in our decidedly non-fantasy world, where blackness is not a non-factor. Regrettably, Frey's identity is thinly written and awkwardly deployed, as the story leans not only on stereotypical narratives, but trauma as a plot device. The complaint here is that the political blackness of the game isn't given enough focus. Polygon felt bait and switch by that first hour, and wanted it everywhere in the game. I feel the opposite way. I wanted none of it in the game. But if they were going to do it, immediately dispensing with it unceremoniously after making it to Athia is probably the worst way to do it. It feels like they're cowardly or something. What they could have done if they really wanted to make a racialized story correctly is have a different group in Athia, maybe not black Athians, that's too on the nose, make them a cast or a fantasy race or green people or something who are treated poorly due to their birth. And Frey, with her outsider knowledge of race relations on Earth, can shed some light on the problem from a perspective that Athians never considered. You could actually make a good story out of that if you tried. The problem here is no one tried. Before I get out of here, there's one final thing to talk about. Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush is a Bethesda game that looks and plays amazing. Everything about it, the cell shaded graphics, the rhythm based combat, the soundtrack, all scream 2000s to me, which of course I'm a sucker for, considering that was the time period of my high school experience. People online are comparing Hi-Fi Rush's dialogue to Forspoken, and fair enough, they're both swamped in millennial writing. Jokes during serious moments, fourth wall breaking stuff, all of it. But the difference is, Forspoken is trying to be a serious fantasy adventure, while simultaneously being embarrassed of itself, while Hi-Fi Rush is a jokey Saturday morning cartoon that knows it is a cartoon. The game is in on the joke, and it's endearing, and it also knows not to go too overboard with it as well. There's a balance here. Hi-Fi Rush strikes it, Forspoken does not. Hi-Fi Rush and Forspoken are being compared on the internet right now because they're polar opposites occupying the same space, and it's not just because they both feature millennial writing. They're the only two notable games to come out during January of 2023. Forspoken has a buildup of multiple years of the Square Enix hype machine behind it, while Hi-Fi Rush was released the same day it was announced, during a recent Xbox Bethesda developer conference, with no hype behind it at all. Forspoken is an open world game, a bland, empty sandbox with nothing to do and nobody interesting in it, while Hi-Fi Rush is a level-based hack and slash, where each of the environments and characters appear to be lovingly crafted. Forspoken launched at 70 US dollars. Sony paid a boatload of money to make it a two-year PS5 console exclusive, and the PC version barely functions unless you've got an amazing graphics card. While Hi-Fi Rush launched for $30 on Xbox and PC, you can play it on your shitty 10-year-old computer, and you can even play it on Game Pass. It's no surprise that Hi-Fi Rush basically blew Forspoken out of the water in terms of popularity, is it? The progs on Twitter are screeching that gamers are all just racist because the cringe writing in Forspoken is identical to Hi-Fi Rush's, but what they don't seem to understand is that context matters. Also, making a good fucking game matters too. By the time this video comes out, I have a feeling that the Forspoken discourse will have already been fully washed away by Hi-Fi Rush's success. I started this script on February 2nd. The game is so indefensibly generic, and people are so tired of being browbeat that the cries of racist sexist gamers aren't going to do anything this time. The game sucks, and that's too bad because there's an okay skeleton in here. The combat, the movement, and even the skill trees are interesting. It just needed a totally different game packaged around it. Which is funny, because Agni's philosophy did in fact look like a totally different game. Same art style, same engine, same mechanics, same assets, but totally different characters. Forspoken really just feels like Square Enix desperately needed to recoup a lot of money. They had bits and bobs of their games lying around, and they decided to mash it all together and race swap the protagonist to make her black because Black Lives Matter sells. Well, it didn't sell enough. If you're gonna get this one, wait for a deep discount, guys. I'm talking like five to ten dollars. Forspoken is not fucking worth it. If you go out to meet a woman at a bar, do you do that? And you're sitting there and you're like, hey, my name is Aquastorm. And she says, Aquastorm, that's really interesting. You know, I grew up by the beach. You fucking hate Donald Trump, says Aquastorm. And she's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. This is all I'm fucking saying. It's all I'm fucking saying.